Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you on the next highlight of the conference. In front of you, Professor Martin Schulze Wessel, uh, one of the best and um, well known German historians. He is a professor of Eastern European history of the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. I will say some words about him, but not the same what you have already in the program. Um, he is a director of Collegium Carolinum. It is a research institute for the history of the Czech lands and Slovakia. Uh, Collegium Calorinum is a very interesting institution, interdisciplinary academic association, which brings together international renowned scholars engaged in the study of the past and present of Czech Republic, Slovakia, and East Central Europe as whole. The association currently has more than 60 members based in Germany, Austria, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, France, Great Britain, Denmark, and the USA. Uh, academic way of uh, Martin Schulze Wessel is connected especially with universities in Munich, Moscow, Berlin, Halle, and Leipzig. Main functions which he has been holding is and was a chairman of the German Historical Association, Verband, Verband der Historiker und Historikerinnen Deutschlands, uh, in, uh, in, it was the years 2012-2016. He was and is also member of the advisory boards of the Deutsches Historisches Institute, German Historical Institute in Warsaw, the Centrum uh, for Zeithistorische Forschung, Center for Contemporary History in Potsdam, uh, of the Georg Eckhardt Institute für Internationale Schulbuchforschung, Georg Eckhardt Institute for International Textbook Research, uh, of the German Institute for uh, German Institute for Poland, so Deutsches Polen Institute in Darmstadt, and he was also I ver I'm very proud of that. He was also a member of academic board of the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity. He published on religious history and Eastern and East uh, Central Europe, the history of the Habsburg monarchy and Czechoslovakia, Eastern Europe from the 18th to the 20th, um, 20th century, century, Russian culture and social history, history of transnationality, and methodologies and the, uh, and the history of research. Professor Martin schulze wessel the floor is yours. Uh, the title of the, um, of the speech will be Universalism and Particularism in Czech or Slovak History after 1989. So a little bit different than in program. So, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you very much uh, for the cooperation and, and the invitation to the great conference and, and the very good organization of the conference. Um, as, as you said, I have a little bit focused my topic. It's not about Eastern Europe, but I focused it to uh, Czech and Czechoslovak history because I know this history better than other Eastern and e Central Eastern European histories. And, uh, well, it turned out that the topic of universalism and particularism is easier to deal with a narrow, with a narrow focus. Never before was the world so near to lasting peace and to quiet but glorious prosperity as it is today. Now and with justice, we shall be able to speak about a golden age. This statement does not come from Tomasz Masaryk and it does not come from Václav Havel, but from the book War with the Newts, written by the Czech writer Karel Chapek in 1935. Uh, well, Newts, that is in Czech, it's Mloki, in German it's Molche, <laughs> and in Polish it's... Uh, Traszka. Okay. Traszki. Okay. 
the cited golden age is the era of the newts. The novel tells of the discovery of the newts on a small island, on a small island near Sumatra. Their initial exploitation in the service of pearl farming, and then on large hydro engineering projects. The beginning of their spread around the oceans of the world and the development of their speech and the absorption of human culture. A common, a common civilization of humans and newts, the, golden, the cited golden age seems to be coming. Development project for newts and international agreements to solve the so-called newt question are placed on the political agenda. But soon the golden age becomes fragile. Hostilities between newts and humans finally lead to the outbreak of a war when the newts declare their need to destroy portions of the world's continents in order to create new coastlines uh, and to expand their living space. So what is the novel about? The war with the newts is the story of how man creates a project, the exploitation of the newts that unfolds a dynamic he did not foresee and increasingly slips away from his control. At the end, there is complete destruction. We know this story, for example, from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and also from other utopian novels by Chapek. Chapek himself has stressed that his novel does not reach into the future. No, this is not utopia, but poor present. It is not speculating about the future, but simply reflecting what exists here and now and where we are stuck in the middle. Chapek and his contemporaries were witnesses of a transformation of a universally conceived order into a system of competing particularisms. This is the second major theme of a novel alongside with man's loss of control over his creation. In the novel, the universalist initiatives that want to regulate the coexistence of humans and newts are confronted with the work of a Königsberg philosopher, Wolf Meinert, The Decline of Mankind, uh, Der Untergang der Menschheit, a very, very subtle illusion. And Meinert writes, we have, we have invented a moral order, human rights, conventions, law equality, humanity, all kind of things. We have created a fiction of mankind which includes us and the rest in some sort of higher unity. What a fatal mistake. We have set out moral law about the law of nature. We have undermined the great natural premise we have undermined the great nat natural premise of all communal life, that only a homogeneous society can be contended. Minot fears universal salamandrism and calls on mankind to, defined its, to defend itself. The war of the newts is a labor laboratory of various universalists, universalist and particularist movements that compete with, with each other. An example of particularism is the propagation of the superiority of a North Newt or the Noble Newt. And the slogan is, solche Erfolge erreichen nur deutsche Molche. <laughs> it's German in the original. What interests me about the novel and about the interwar period and contemporary history since 1989 is the transition from universalistic to particularistic orders. This is a major theme in European and global history, which can also be observed, for example, in the transition from the French Revolution to political romanticism in the early 19th century. Like in the period after the French Revolution, universally conceived orders Failed, uh, failed after 1918, and we are afraid also after 1989. Universal claims insist on universally valid rules, the demand for which, however, usually also follows concrete interests. 
In, co in contrast, particularist models of order reject any general claim to validity and justify maxims of action that are oriented towards the interest and towards the symbolic order of particular communities. An important question in this context is how and why the transition from universalism to particularism actually takes place. I do not have any theory to offer to you, just some observations. Czechoslovak and Czech history is an interesting field for this. President Václav Havel and Prime Minister and then President Václav Klaus, oh, what's this, uh, wrong direction, I should, uh, <laughs> Okay. Just, uh, uh, yeah. Sure. Oh. One more. It's, oh. it's wrong, but it doesn't matter. We can go on without. It's, it's just an illustration. Uh, I, I do not need the PowerPoint. It's, you took the smaller, or I sent the smaller PowerPoint, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so, what do you like most? Maybe this. <laughs> um, the whole presentation in, is, is just because of the um, Loki, because of the salamanders. <laughs> so you can take this with you if you don't like the lecture. Um, so Czechoslovak or Czech history is an tr interesting field for this. President Václav Havel and Prime Minister or President Václav Klaus seem to represent the contradiction between universalist and particularist legitimations of politics in an almost ideal typical way. Here the fighter for freedom and human rights and the Nobel Peace Prize winner, there the nationalist and Eurosceptic who also denies global warming and that means the global claim of science. This contradiction is real, but there are transitions and ambivalences. Calling for economic reforms, also Klaus preferred a universal liberal, liberal pathos. At the same time, he posed on the national mythic mountain Blanik with a medieval shield when he appealed to the Czechs to maintain national unity. And at this point, I had a nice picture. Let us begin with a few observations on Václav Havel's presidency. It drew its authority from the struggle for human rights that Havel had waged as a dissident. Moreover, he referred symbolically to the moral universalism of the first Czechoslovak president, Tomáš Masaryk. However, Masaryk's humanism was linked to a particular nation, to the Czechs, not so much to the Czechoslovaks, and the same is true for Havel, as his speeches clearly show. His first speech as a president begins with a ruthless description of the present. Our country is not flourishing. The great potential of our peoples is not used meaningfully. We have contamin contaminated our soil, rivers, forests. But that is not the most important thing yet. The worst thing is that we live in a morally corrupt environment. We have become morally ill because we have become accustomed to saying something and thinking something else. But then the speaker offers a way out. If the citizens now have a chance to take their affairs into their own hands, they will refer to the humanist and democratic traditions that were, as Havel said, transmitted on unconsciously from one generation to the next so that each of us can take them up at the right time and keep them alive. Humanism and democracy would unleash the country's enormous potential. This was Havel's 1990 promise. 20 years later, he had ended up in disappointment. In his last, last speech in November 2009, Havel stated, the political parties are slightly illegal structures of the state, 
which somewhere in a gray zone des decide what the state should do. Large parts of a, Czech, of a Czech landscape are subject to an abnormal construction boom of large warehouses and shopping malls. In a quite senseless way, the Czech Republic wants to become an energy great power. In short, there's nothing, uh, excuse me, in short, there's something strange to dangerous about the way our country is flourishing. Thus, the dynamic was unleashed, but the society was, devolving, was devol developing in a strange and da dangerous direction. Even stylistically, this reminds of the war with the Newts. The unleashed forces of capitalism can no longer be constrained, and something monstrous emerges. 20 years after the breakup in the spirit of universalistic values, Havel was converted to conservative skepticism, defending his homeland. Let us now have a short look at three fields of policy, that is international relations, uh, the constitutional order, and economics at the end. First, foreign policy, in which the tension between universalistic and particularistic legitimations of politics can be shown particularly well. President Havel's first trip abroad to the US was a high point in the development, in the development of universalism. The president traveled to the US with a huge delegation, including the president's friends disguised as journalists, and the American press celebrated the freedom fighters in advance. It was an unrepeatable moment when the former dissident and elected president of Czechoslovakia appeared before the American Congress on the 21st February 1990. Havel was aware of the great expectations he had to meet. I'm speaking to you, Havel stated, as the representative of a country that has set out on the road to democracy, a country where there is complete freedom of speech, which is getting ready, ready for free elections, and which wants to create a prosperous market economy and its own foreign policy. Havel combined this commitment to the liberal consensus, to the liberal consensus of 1989 with an equally emphatic universalism in international relations. In doing so, however, he did not support a policy of Western dominance. Rather, Havel called for something else. The main thing is, it seems to me, that these revolutionary changes will enable us to escape from the rather antiquate, antiquated straitjacket of a bipolar view of the world and to enter in an era of multipolarity, that is, into an era in which all of us, large and small, former slaves and former masters, will be able to create what your great president, Abraham Lincoln, called the family of man. Can you imagine what a relief this would be to the part of the world which for some reason is called the third world, even though it is the largest? Havel's foreign policy in relation to Germany was also founded on universal morality. As soon as he took office, he put the issue of reconciliation of a, uh, with uh, Sudeten Germans on the agenda, which the Czechoslovak public was not yet prepared for. This topic shows in detail how a universalist breakup can find itself on the defensive in public discussions and ultimately lead to a particularist policy. Sudeten German and Bavarian politics also played a part in this. On the whole, however, Czechoslovak and Czech foreign policy was not characterized by transition from universalism to particularism, but by a constant tension between these two orientations. The president and the government took opposing positions. For Havel, support of human rights and the strong Euro-Atlantic orientation were essential. In 1999, 
He harshly criticized Milos Zeman's government, which when it vacillated over supporting NATO's aerial bombing of Serbia, Havel described the military action as a humanitarian act whose purpose was to prevent the expulsion of the Albanians from Kosovo. Throughout Klaus' presidency, the conflict with the government remained on foreign policy issues, but under reversed circumstances. Klaus distinguished, distinguished himself as a politician who pursued not universal or multilateral, but national interests in foreign policy. The common thread running through his presidency was his opposing to deepening EU integration. This included his attempts to block the European Constitution and the Lisbon Treaty. Prime ministers responded by criticizing the president for overstepping his powers. Prime Minister Jerzy Parobek even threatened to limit the president's foreign travel and put forward the idea that the president would have to follow government's instruction. President Zeman followed Klaus' example. During the crisis in Ukraine in 2014, he opposed sanctions imposed by the EU against Russia and thus came into conflict with the position taken by Bohuslav Sobotka's government. O only in the constellation now of Zeman and Babish, there is no contradiction between the president and the government. The course of foreign policy was therefore controversial in the first three presidencies. The conflict between president and government was always characterized by the opposition of universalistic or at least multilateral and particularistic political legitimations. The second field uh, is equality and human rights and the constitutional order of uh, Czechoslovak or Czech Republic. Universal and particular party <coughs> principles also clashed in the establishment of human rights in the constitutional order. The Czech Republic acceded to the Council of Europe in 1993, thereby joining the European Convention of Human Rights, which protects human rights and political freedoms in Europe in a universalistic spirit. The crucial question for Czech politics was, however, whether fundamental rights and freedoms should be included in the constitu Constitution and guaranteed by the Constitutional Court. This dispute was settled in favor of fundamental rights. It was not before December 1992 that the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms was incorporated into the constitutional order of the Czech Republic. According to Article 10 of the Constitution, the Czech Republic um, uh, uh, the, the Constitution, uh, in, according to the Constitution, conventions for the protection of human rights take precedence over national legislation. One year later, the Constitutional Court of the Czech Republic was established as a specialized type of court which primarily works to protect the people of the Czech Republic against viol the violations of the constitutions. Thus, he continues the tradition of the First Republic when Czechoslovakia being the first country in the world with a system of judicial <coughs> review by a specialized court. The Czech constitution makers, when drafting the provisions concerning the constitutional court, were also significantly inspired by the German basic law and constitutional system. This is especially true in the court's power to review actions of public authorities concerning fundamental rights and basic freedom. The German Constitutional Court radically changed legal culture in post-war post Germany. The sovereignty of the parliament was limited by the court's decision and its reasoning founded on human rights arguments. The German Constitutional Court attacked the formalist application 
of legal and constitutional rules and favors broader arguments based on values, the principle of justice and fundamental human rights. The transfer of a German model, which is of course based on specific German experiences with National Socialism, to the Czech Republic gave the Constitutional Court in Brno a strong posi position in relation to the parliament and the government. In the field of human rights, the principle of justice as fairness and equal treatment of all were strengthened. At the same time, the constitutional universalism was attacked as an adoption of a foreign model which does maybe not fit to the Czech tradition. With regard to the design of equality rights, um, one has to have a look also at, at certain similarities to the constitutions of other Central and Eastern European states. Like all constitutions in Central and Eastern Europe, it contains an explicit prohibition of discrimination and like the great majority of uh, Central and East European states, it attaches a, least, a list of specific grounds of prohibited discrimination based on race, gender, and religion, and other criteria. It is interesting to note that there is one great and obvious absentee, namely sexual orientation. No one of, of the constitutions in Central and Eastern Europe mentions sexual orientation as a ground of prohibited discrimination. There seems to be, however, one specificity in the Czech constitutional culture which differs from other Central and Eastern European states. Many post-socialist constitutions entail a ban on positive discrimination. Such reverse discrimination occurs when privileges are granted to a group that has traditionally been discriminated against. The Czech Constitutional Court in a 2007 decision pointed out that equality is a relative category and allowed preferential treatment in order to counterbalance existing inequalities. That is, has been worked out by Wojciech Sadurski. The decision of the Czech Constitutional Count Court can be very well related to Robert Walkin's considerations of a difference between the right to equal treatment and the superior right to being treated as an equal. That means constitutional culture is a field in which a universalistic orientation has been adopted in the early 90s to a relatively high degree. And it is amazing that in the, pream in the preamble of the Constitution, there is no mention of the Czechs as a nation. It's just the Czechs as, as citizens, what is an, another sign for the non-particularist approach of the Constitution. And this Constitution has not been changed since uh, the 1990s. So the next policy field is economics. Not surprisingly, Czech politics after 1989 were in favor of a contemporary liberal consensus in the field of economics. In contrast to most other political questions, economic liberalization between Havel and Klaus was not, fundamental, not fundamentally controversial. Klaus pursued the policy with even greater consequence and rhetorical worth. If one considers a certain aspect of liberalization, namely the privatization of state property, certain ambivalences become, become obvious among the actors of transformation. There's one excellent source for this question, a discussion book with Tomasz Jeszek, published by Peter Husak. Tomasz Jeszek had a remarkable, a remarkable biography, not completely untypical for his generation. In socialist Czech Czechoslovakia, he had worked as an economist in the Czechoslovak Academy of Science, 
among others in the Institute for Prognostics, where he was a colleague of Václav Klaus. At the same time, Jacek was engaged in the dissident culture. He translated the writings of the economist Friedrich Hayek into Czech for the Samistat. In 1989, he was one of the founders of the party Civic Democratic Alliance, and after the first free elections in June 1990, became Minister of National Property and Privatization in the government of Petr Pittard. In this, front, in this function, he made remarkable observations about privatization. He, he was a real believer in the liberalization program, but after some time, he got more and more disappointed. The liberalization became a moral problem for him through when, when he discovered that so-called dirty money played a role, a significant role in the privatization. In this question, Jacek took a position contrary to Klaus, who argued that there was only one kind of money, not dirty and non-dirty money. In order not to endanger the privatization, Jacek was forced to close his eyes to the, as he mentioned, faces of strange people and strange money robbed of by speculators, Bolsheviks, or strange people of other categories. Due to the uncontrollable consequences of privatization, Jacek tried to protect at least a symbolic remaining portfolio of Czech state property from the excess of global capital. Jacek used the wording of family silver, which the state should not, should not sell. As he stated a few years later, he had in mind only a handful of companies whose sale would, in his opinion, uh, have caused public protests. Remarkably, remarkably, it was mainly about breweries, Pilsensky Pivova, Butva, and in addition, in addition, the porcelain factory, Kalovarsky Porcelain. Jacek complained several times I've heard foreign investors said, say that we are not liberals and that we discriminate against foreign investors. One of the paradoxes of privatization was linked with the return of Tomasz Batya, who established the Batya Group in Slin in the time of the First Republic. The fact that Batya wanted to continue the entrepreneurial tradition in the Czech Republic seemed like a signal for the return of the good old days. It seemed to reconcile the globalization with particularist emotions. However, Batya, the Batya family proved to be an extremely hard negotiating financial shark even more than the global players who came from abroad. Basically, Batya demanded a non, for a non-legal restitution, which was disguised as a purchase and in the end received the state property almost as a gift. For Jacek, the expectations he had as a liberal economist and the experiences he made dealing with dirty money and defending the nation against the sale of family silver diverged widely. He spoke very vividly of his own disappointment that resulted from this. The starting point was, as he remembered, a refusal of specific ways of reform and the support of the liberal consensus of 1989. In the beginning, Jacek said, we started from the only, the only general certainty, certainty that we were introducing a market economy based on private ownership and from the growing certainty that there could be no further a la perestroika, a la Hungarian reforms, a la Yugoslav model. The vision of a liberal reformer had, however, a conservative corporate background with a strong romantic element. I myself, remembered Jacek, dreamed of a clean, well-ordered little Austrian town with white houses, pubs, and peace of mind. I imagined the beautiful Sundays 
when the people came out of a church, all the houses were whitewashed, all the fences were painted, and all the paths raked. Liberal reforms did not bring about a well-ordered society. Jacek's disenchantment was very similar to Havel's horror about shopping malls. The unleashing of capitalism destroyed the social and, what is important, the aesthetic vision of the first generation of reformers. This was a development that fostered the transformation of universalistic liberal values into conservative particularistic views. Well, my uh, conclusion, my first, I, I have two conclusions or two remarks at the end. The first is that th there is no clear shift from universalistic to particularistic patterns in, and policy le legitimations. In the three policy fields I had, had a closer look at, the logics are quite different. In international relations, there's a strong universalistic beginning in the time of Václav Havel, and then a permanent tension between the president and the government, which only recently in the constellation of Seemann and Babish has turned into a joint anti-universalistic tendency. However, the Czech Republic um, did not stop its international engagement, for example, in Afghanistan. In the field of a constitutional order, human rights and legal equality, the situation is relatively stable. The constitution has a universalistic, not particularistic pathos, and human rights are still part of a constitutional order and reality. One could discuss, of course, about the migration question and the, the refugee question in this context. In the field of economics, the integration of a Czech Republic into a global economy is a fact, but this change has become the source of a strong particularistic sentiment, as shown in the case of Tomasz Jezek. Some secondary conclusions or remarks about memory. Only in the field of economics, um, only the field of economics seems to have become a source for the collective memory of a period since 1989. Economy affects everybody. But there are also other reasons for the high relevance of this particular policy field. The stories one can, one can tell about the international relations is the Czech Republic has become a member of the Western international community, and that's it. Yeah? The story of a constitutional order is just like, like that simple. The Czech Republic has established a constitutional uh, order on the ground of universalist principles that has not been challenged, really. Um, where's my... Well, in the field of economics, um, there are these al already quoted parallels with the story of the nudes. Making business with the nudes was like unleashing capitalism of 1989. And uh, this is why the Chapek novel is, and, and of course, similar novels like the Frankenstein Parable are uh, somehow revealing and interesting for the understanding of the disappointments of 1989. So thank you for the intention. So thank you very much, Professor Schulzer Wessel. And now is the time for you to commentaries or questions. Who first? <laughs> it was only suggestion. <laughs> Thank you very much for your lecture. Um, uh, one, um, 
I have actually two, two, two questions or two remarks maybe. Uh, the first one relates to, to how, how you use uh, these notions of particularism and universalism. I didn't quite get whether, whether you use it as a analytical tools for, for like analyzing these developments in different fields, uh, different policy fields, or uh, in how far do you also consider it as rhetorical strategies of the actors then? Um, because this seems to be seems seems to me quite an interesting um, course of of reasoning and course of analysis um, as well, which maybe maybe I didn't get it was not so much present uh, actually in, in in what you told us. This would be the first point. The second one um, about this like um, yeah conservative romantic uh, background of of uh, liberal imaginaries, um, which which. Uh, um, which, which is one, one, one can also observe, for example, very well in, in, in uh, Miroslav Jelski's uh, thinking about which we have uh, shortly, shortly talked uh, two days ago. Uh, he also comes, uh, like, uh, combines a very conservative, neo-conservative Catholicism with, with, uh, with ultra-libertarian um, like notions. Um, uh, in, in how far is this uh, like a conservative, romantic maybe, uh, um, a background of liberal uh, thinking grounded in the, in the, in the uh, dissident experience uh, which uh, many of these, these people uh, have uh, in, uh, yeah, to, to a more or to, to a bigger or smaller extent. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Shall I answer or directly or maybe. shall we collect? Maybe. Well, uh, uh, very good question. Thank you very much. Uh, well, the question whether universalistic and, and particularistic uh, orientations are analytic, an analytical tool or strategy of the actors, I think that there's no real divergence. Uh, uh, they use this uh, universalism in, in, in the, the semantic of, of Václav ha uh, Havel, for example, but also of many others, also of Václav Klaus in certain questions, is full of universalistic notions. And uh, this is what I'm analyzing. So there is, I think, no contradiction. One could ask, uh, if I um, regard this universalism as something real, uh, th this would be a real contradiction, uh, but I, I analyze it as a notion of the, of the actors. And the second point is very important as well. Um, indeed, what Jezek said sounds very Catholic. Indeed, he was a Protestant. Uh, or, uh, and... Um, one could relate uh, his ideas, of course, also to the dissident culture, but this is a difficult operation. Well, of course, dissident culture um, fosters some sense of community, and, and this might be a ground for the romantic ideas of the first generation of, of, uh, of reformers. Mm. But, but it would be interesting to me what you think about it. Uh, I'm speculating now. Professor mm. Bokman. Thank you. Um, so I, I, have a, I was wondering if particularism is actually a universal, so like it has a universal qualities to it, that it's a, it's a universal toolbox that one can take and things that are our particular are in that toolbox. It's like, the, the, like, for example, the nation state is a particular thing, but the nation state is a universal category that um, exists in this time period. So I'm just wondering if there's actually a universalistic aspect of particularism that we're seeing. And then the second question I have is, is that I wonder in the case maybe of the people from Slovakia, like maybe they feel that the values of 1989, the political is actually the most contested and the most disappointing mm -hmm. uh, because of the, I'm thinking of James Crapfull's book about, the, about 1989 mm -hmm. and, the, and the hopes of that time period. So in fact, it might be the most disappointing aspect is the political rather than the economic or both. 
You, you mean the Mecha period? Um, the, the, yeah. the political changes in Slovakia after the... Well, even right now, even now there's some uh, uh, protests about the way democracy is going in Slovakia, so... I, so no. uh, well, I, I think Slovakia is the best doing country in East Central Europe uh, in terms of democracy. Uh, but but I will think about it. Indeed, I left out the uh, Slovak uh, case, uh, and uh, at least for the first years, one should also think about the uh, development in Slovakia. The other question is, of course, very important, and it would be easier for me to respond to it if, if you had asked the other way around. Uh, universalism is, of course, always particularistic because it entails certain interests and, and specific uh, symbolic orders. And if, but if you ask what is universal about uh, particularisms, um, well, I, I think it's very difficult to reconcile nation, various nationalisms. Uh, this pan-nationalism is, is an academic idea or, or which just reflects that nationalism is at the same time in different countries. But to build alliances between nationalists uh, and, and populists in the present uh, proves and has proven to be extremely difficult. For example, you could not think about German and Polish nationalists uh, forming an alliance, even though they have common views, some common views, and, and the alliances between uh, Gauland and Marine Le Pen are always very fragile, though they have common uh, political views. Yeah, okay. I could tell you more about nudes. <laughs> Anybody interested? <laughs> <laughs> One short, oh, oh yeah, no. One short follow-up question, maybe. Um, uh, what do you think about the like relationship between um, liberalism or neoliberalism, also neoliberal economic policy, uh, which uh, you have had a look on, and um, let's say this right-wing authoritarianist populism, we, uh, which we um, are experiencing now, not not only in uh, East Central Europe but uh, also there. Um, because as you as you uh, as you presented us uh, shortly this this example of Václav Klaus and his e he being a yeah really tough neoliberal uh, uh, in, in, on the one hand and also um, uh, yeah integrating a strong economic nationalism into it um, one might wonder about like uh, sources of of this uh, of this development uh, we 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 are experiencing now in actually these. Uh, these, uh, yeah, in this in this way of think, thinking, I'm, I'm thinking about the the AfD also being a party in Germany, uh, uh, which has grown out of a, a yeah movement of neoliberal economic professors uh, mm -hmm. fighting against the euro, uh, and and so so how would you um, reflect on this on this linkage between mm -hmm. yeah neoliberalism and um, illiberal um, yeah popular right-wing popular nationalist populism yeah well th there's a broad literature about it and there are people who can better elaborate on on this question than I can but uh, I, I see a very close uh, relationship between uh, neoliberalism and nationalism well somebody uh, referred to Klaus as, uh, today as a economic nationalists uh, when, when he, and the quotation was just about his um, saying that the Czechs should work hard. There was even no nationalist formulation if I got it rightly. Uh, but, but of course uh, this uh, um, statement was right. I, th I think this brutal appeal to work hard and uh, we, which is linked of course also with uh, social 
unsensitiveness uh, leads to, to nationalism. There's a, there's a very close, close relationship to this. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit more. Uh, you talked about the constitution. Um, maybe constitution would be a place where potentially the universal and the particular can come together, especially in this important moment of affirming or giving like a birth certificate to the new new nation that emerges um, mm -hmm. in transformation, mm -hmm. right? Um, so. And, and also affirming a sense of identity, um, civic identity. So maybe if you could comment on um, how, how you see elements of the universal in particular being combined. You talked about it mm. being universalist uh, to a very high degree and the fact that there was no mention of Czechs as a nation, rather Czechs as citizens, and I think that's very interesting. Um, and also I'm very interested in your view, uh, to what extent does Havel's vision, um, his kind of ethical leadership and his dissident background, um, if, if at all, uh, to what extent did it shape discourse and, and the final um, shape of the constitution itself? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, well, thank you very much for these questions. Um, in, indeed, one could, and this is also uh, an answer to your question, one, one could uh, combine this uh, particularist and universalist elements uh, with regard to the Constitution because fundamental rights are per definition for the citizens of, of a state and therefore they are not universal but particular in their scope. Um, but interestingly, uh, the Czech constitution, the constitutional order by adopting international treaties like the European um, Treaty for the Protection of Human Rights and by giving this, these treaties a high uh, position, a high status in, in the constitutional order, by doing this a particular order is opened in a universal, universalistic spirit. And uh, I think it's really amazing that the Czech Constitution of 1993 does not start with a sentence, we, the Czech nation, give this constitution and so on. It's just uh, that the Czech citizens, uh, th this is the subject of the constitution. And with regard to memory, uh, it's uh, somehow it's a pity that nobody uh, I'm, would like to know whether the, the Czech participants of a, of a conference here, whether they know this universalistic, about this universalistic spirit of a constitution. I think it's widely unknown, even, even in the Czech public, uh, and this is uh, yeah, somehow characteristic and telling for the for the actual for the situation today. In what way? Well, we we could be or the Czechs could be proud of this, I would say, and uh, it is uh, there is no myth, there is no memory about it, and and the. Um, economic history, which has brought has has brought so many disappointments. Um, it has a myth in the background, and this this is the myth um, that something has been unleashed, what cannot be controlled anymore. This Frankenstein myth, and this place, as there is a myth in the background. So this plays a greater role for the memory, I, I would say. I would like to follow up on this discussion uh, because I was uh, impressed by this narrative that the um, Grundgesetz, the German basic law, uh, played such a role as reference and uh, the career of the Grundgesetz itself is a very tricky one. First of all, because it, the first sentence does not speak of Germans, it speaks about human beings which are entitled to dignity, which 
must not be touched upon, and everything the state has to do is to protect it. And, uh, but this is picking up on a tradition also, if you go back to the very classic uh, uh, declaration of human rights, etc. The interesting thing is that uh, in the German case, evidently uh, there is this uh, narrative where this was the outcome of a very peculiar coincidence of former Weimar Republic politician slash resistance people plus being put into one big room by the Western Allied to work out this uh, constitution with certain guidelines. And later on it developed this, uh, the real universalistic essence of it was adopted by German society through the mechanisms of the constitutional court. So uh, actually universalism as a mindset was coming later. I would say the, the people giving the institution were not altogether uh, on the height of the universalistic wording of it. And the ish question now is, uh, can you or should we optimistically expect to happen, this to happen also in uh, cases such as Czechoslovakia? Uh, I think it's seriously because in the West German case it took really decades before these universalistic aspirations and implication unfolded, basically. Mm -hmm. It started in the third decade, I would say, that the real uh, potential of such a thinking unfolded and uh, in a rather, let's say, well, one could nearly say autonomous way. It did not have to wait specifically for, for neoliberalism to set in. There were all kinds of other agendas which could further this and I'm quite confident the, the dynamic is not yet over. It will move on. Yeah. Uh, well, th thank you very much. I, I would stress, like you did, that the Constitution alone uh, does not say much, but that the constitutional order as a whole should be regarded. And in this sense, uh, the Constitutional Court plays a great role. And the question, what position the Constitutional Court has in the system of the government and the and, and the parliament and uh, the jurisdiction. And in this sense, I think the, the story really starts in, in the Czech case in the interwar period as uh, Czechoslovakia had the first constitutional court with, with the exclusive task to uh, protect the people against government actions. And this is a point one can refer to, and this is a tradition that can uh, evolve, and therefore I'm, I'm quite optimistic in, in the sense you asked. Mm. I have a question about the category, which is hopefully, according to many, I would agree, uh, the category is capital, or not money, but the capital as such, financial capital, I mean, whether, according to you, it is a particular, a besonderen, or it is a universal. Because those who own capital and are able to actively uh, shape the fragments of the world market and global market are in better position than those who are not capable of generating the capital, financial capital, I mean. And this distinction in between Marx, Weber, and uh, Zimmel and Lenin is very flagrant one, and this is one of the intricacies of all those stories. How universal was the Bolsheviks? It was not, except that it turned out that it discovered this importance of capital. So the question is, do you agree whether capital has nationhood or rather it does not? Because the populist and nationalist claim it does. For example, Germany has many in multinationals, many Western countries, uh, since they were previously industrialized, they were managing bef at the time of Lenin to be uh, the donors of financial capitals, influencing the events far away their territory. So the subjects in the present world differ in very important respect with, res with respect to the 
uh, lack or to the abundance of financial capital of their own making. This is why the, in previous session I have noticed uh, or this Havel, this, this uh, Klaus story or about the, this German, East German story that West German wanted to be efficient. They want to take market and they treated DDR instrumentally very much, which turned out to be, have such disastrous consequences. So this is the point in between the link linchpin or linkage between the universal and the particular, the capital I mean. It is a, not ma market economy as such only. Market was in the Middle Ages or in the ancient times, the market were always. But <laughs> the, the industrial capital, the industrial capitalism, then the financial capitalism, and this you know, after Lenin, so 100 years ago, what do you think? Does capital has nationhood or not? This is the problem. Well, uh, Václav Klaus would have said, no, it has no nationhood, and uh, Tomasz Jerzek would have said to a certain degree, it should have a nationhood. Uh, well, the dilemma of uh, the reformers in the 90s was like in all other East Central European countries, that uh, foreign capital had to be welcomed for, for obvious reasons. And that at the, on the other side, uh, there was this emotional view on, uh, on the foreign investments that the so-called family silver was sold out. And uh, that in the not only emotional view that control was lost. Um, and uh, well, th this is what, what the re reformers observed, but what they did not expect to such a de degree. Uh, for example, in the Ministry of, uh, of Privatization, there were American advisors who did not only gave advice to the Czech politicians, but who gave direct advice to American companies what would be worth for purchase. And, and um, well, these disappointments and uh, so on, this comes from the real history of the privatization as, as it was in the Czech Republic and certainly all, also in, in the other uh, East Central European states, in, in the GDR for certain. So we will have probably a longer break, uh, coffee break. But I have one, one commentary mm. to the uh, to this um, point: constitution and uh, absence of the uh, sexual orientation as a, mm. one of uh, prohibited discrimination grounds. Uh, I checked, of course, the Polish constitution reading your text and found there that this is Article uh, 32. It will be really short. Mm, the point first, all persons shall be equal before the law. All persons shall have the right to equal treatment by public authorities. The point two, no one shall be discriminated against in political, social, or economic life for any reason whatsoever. So yeah. there is no list. Yeah, uh, but uh, it, it's uh, not contrary to what I said. I said most uh, Eastern European, Central and Eastern European countries have a list of uh, prohibited grounds yeah. for di discrimination, and there are three countries which do not have, and Poland mm -hmm. is one of them, Albania is another, okay. and I have forgotten <laughs> the third country. But, but that's true. And one should add uh, that the fact that uh, sexual orientation is not a prohibited ground for discrimination does not mean that the constitutional courts um, do not ban uh, sexual d discrimination. They can, of course, do it, but it is not uh, in, in this list, mm -hmm. and this is mm -hmm. somehow telling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you allow, I have one, one question uh, about the historical policy in Czech Republic. Uh, 
under the universalist and particularist about the differences uh, in the approach to the history and historical policy? Um, well, I, I, I mentioned uh, one question which, which has to do with history, that's the uh, question of, of the expulsions of uh, Sudeten Germans. This was a topic Havel raised uh, during his first, or before, even before his first visit abroad. His first visit was to Eastern Berlin and then to Munich. And already then, that is in the first days of his presidency, he said, we have to raise this question uh, of, of the expulsions. And this was, there is no doubt that this was in a very moral and universalistic uh, mood, which was not prepared in the Czech uh, public, and therefore a very difficult discussion began, and uh, Havel was criticized from many sides and did not find acceptance um, from many of his supporters even. So this is a very telling story f for, for the history of the transition of universalistic to particularistic beginnings. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you because we, as a European network, uh, yeah. are actually an example of uh, historical policy of Czech yeah. Republic. You maybe know that um, the negotiation about the grand uh, foundation of the European network uh, took part um, in the first part of the 21st century, and Czech Republic and Austria took part in these negotiations, but they, um, in the last moment, don't um, agree mm. with the last Absichtserklärung. Um, uh, 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 so, uh, um, declaration of intention mm. Mm. Um, uh, about grounding the European network. Uh, behind that was the idea and the fear that the network will, uh, and um, especially uh, concentrated on Polish German uh, historical problems, and Czechs uh, were um, uh, far they want to do, um, and their opinion that uh, they want to make their, uh, or to, uh, to, um, to um, discuss the problematic issue on their own. But some years after that, uh, they um, decided to, about the grounding of the, on an, another institution, uh, um, named Platform of European Memory and Conscience. Uh, the difference between uh, the network and the platform is that uh, the, uh, the members of the, of the European network are states and the members of the platform are institutions. So they are um, actually more uh, political. They are more involved in the actual uh, policy than we. Uh, than we are, but it was the decision of the um, Czech, mm. um, Czech, Czech, poli Czech policy. Uh, mm. uh, and we are still working on having the Czech Republic among our uh, country members, uh, unfortunately, unsuccessfully yet. So, is there any question or commentary? Uh, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to bring the discussion back to memory, although um, you've already uh, done it, so thank you. But I, <clears throat> I wanted to return to the question that the colleague over there asked, which kind of got lost about um, Havel's kind of ethical vision of politics and how it perhaps informed some of these universalist and particularist, uh, uh, this, this dichotomy. Uh, because um, if we're thinking about memory, um, Two days ago at this conference, uh, Muriel Blev had um, a presentation in which she pointed out that the, the memory of Václav Havel is becoming increasingly critical in the Czech Republic. And I think this is something mm -hmm. we're really seeing, that he's increasingly um, on 
both sides of the political spectrum is being kind of uh, criticized from, from various angles. And one of these uh, criticisms is certainly aimed at his vision of non-political politics as something that actually kind of debilitated uh, the, the Czech political, the development of, uh, of a kind of healthy political culture uh, mm -hmm. in the Czech Republic after 89 because uh, it portrayed politics as something kind of immoral and dirty. Mm. Um, and on the other hand, we have the economists like Klaus, who kind of along the, this kind of neoliberal credo were trying to almost separate the sphere of economics from politics, kind of claiming that, you know, it's the invisible hand of the market and politics has nothing to do with how the market um, works. So uh, from, from both sides, there's almost this kind of like a sense of a demonization of politics. And I'm just wondering how this uh, dynamic and the memory of it now, which is also kind of becoming more and more strong, plays into your framework of universalist and particularist mm -hmm. um, tendencies. Well, th that's a wonderful comment. And I, I would say in addition to, to what I said, and a very important addition, um, of, of course, uh, Havel is, is uh, seen very critically in the meanwhile uh, for, as you said, for, for different reasons. Um, I would say it's, it's, uh, it has one reason in the 1990s, which are generally in, in many Eastern European, East and Central European countries are seen critically, and he is, of course, the, or one of the central figures of the 90s. Uh, and another reason I've uh, not yet thought about it, but, but another reason really could be this unpolitical politic. Um, but <laughs> I really should think about it and, and answer later by in, in another con conference, maybe, or in the break. Yeah, I, think, <laughs> yeah? I think Václav Bělohradský has, has written about this particular critique as well, so... Uh -huh, but, yeah. uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, in this situation, we can close this uh, panel and have a little bit longer coffee break. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.